I grew up in Tornado Alley. My house was blown away when I was three years old. My twin and I saw um, a ball of red lightning go through our room, which we thought, because we were three years old, was a red fire engine. For years and years and years, we thought it was. But it was St. Elmo's fire. Wow. St. Elmo's fire is well known in old sailing ships because it would travel up and down the masts. And sometimes it would land and light the, the um, uh, ship of fire. And usually it's above waters. And there's a river behind us. And very, very few people have survived being very close to St. Elmo's fire. But it blew through our um, house as our house imploded. If you have all your windows down for a tornado, the pressure is such that a house will implode on itself rather than explode out. And um, that shot through the living room and through our bedroom. And we were sitting and watching it together. And the next thing we knew, the winds tore us apart. I was buried under our front porch, which ran the length of the house. My arm was broken here and here. Uh, my youngest brother was three months old in one of those big overstuffed 50s chairs in a, in a woven um, uh, basket kind of cradle. Um, he, the floor fell out from underneath him. He was covered in insulation and would be dead had his bedding not whirled around him and formed a little air pocket, a little air balloon, and he was not touched or scratched. And um, my, as soon as that St. Elmo's fire went through and shot the wall and everything imploded. Now this is something I learned as growing up because I didn't know what happened. And we were pulled apart. That's the house was imploding at that time. Most of my siblings have scars from flying glass from being down like this because there were French windows in the house that went. My twin has scars on her back. And apparently my sister said I dug myself out of the rubble, my oldest sister, because we were found holding hands walking down the road several hours later. The storm hit at 9.05 at night and all people with small children had them in bed and there were no early warning systems at that time and most people did not have storm cellars. This was the biggest recorded storm um, uh, cell with multiple tornadoes and the most unusual recorded lightning in the history of the United States still. I lived in Boulder, Colorado and at uh, the National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric right. Center there at NOAA. Um, you go up on the hill and there's a film about our tornado showing the most unusual lightning ever recorded. Flash lightning, um, streak lightning, and uh, yellow, blue, green, white uh, ball of the St. Elmo's fire. Uh, never recorded anywhere else before. It was the first time University of Oklahoma and University of Kansas had planted sensors from southern Oklahoma to mid-Kansas to record lightning flashes, and it was the most powerful lightning storm ever recorded. So wow. that was our storm. It was and you were just three. awesome. We were three. And uh, the reason I tell this story and tell you about St. Elmo's Fire is that if you're ready for me to, it leads right into the story about my dad and the night to, that he didn't go to the storm cellar. <laughs> well, before you tell us the the the, 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 the story, mm -hmm. can you just finish this up. None of your family was killed in this episode. Well, now that's interesting. Um, our neighbor, too, if you're looking out toward the front this way, our house was destroyed. Eight or seven of the eight of us were alive at the time. Nobody was killed. My next oldest brother was across town at my grandmother's house. He helped her uh, get into the storm cellar. She was 88. And um, she pulled the door shut and then she said, oh no, no, you have to look for Mabel. And he said, but grandma, the storm's blowing hard. She, she said, wait for a quiet minute, look for Mabel. And that was her neighbor. And my brother lifted up that storm door and he looked out and there she was struggling to open her storm cellar. And the wind came up and my, dad, and my brother watched her get pulled away. The tornado pulled her and took her. He slammed that shut and bolted it. They were in there for three days. My grandmother had stored kerosene for the lantern. She had a slop bucket and she'd stored water and they survived three days down there. They did not die. She had a stroke and died. Um, that was in May, the following December. But my next door neighbor, 
she sat in her rocker all the time. She was pretty deaf. She didn't really hear the storm. And they found her the next day floating on one of her doors in that rocker with a two-by-four through her. Ooh. But we, none of us, was killed. But our home was totally destroyed. Wow. Um, and uh, we with, were with that background, <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you for, I, I just, I thought other people would be curious about the, uh, the, the storm. But you've got another storm story, and let's hear that. Oh, you mean how tornadoes came to be, or the? No, 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 you're no, the one, no you're about your father. about your father. About my father, yes. yeah. <laughs> yes, yep. Yeah. This is, this is uh, affectionately called hit the hole. So <laughs> it was just a few years after the tornado, and my mother was a nervous wreck. And uh, we had a newly installed uh, early warning storm system, which went off all the time because in north central Oklahoma, literally Tornado Alley, we had so many tornadoes come through that you had to go to the storm cellar from March through September at least 15 to 20 times. Ooh. And uh, it was no joke, school was let out. Uh, they'd sound the signals. They were hoping that they had 30 minutes from the time school let out for people to get home and get into a shelter. And um, my dad was um, hardworking, had eight kids, didn't get a lot of privacy or a lot of rest. And my mother was such a nervous Nellie that she just, as the weather got bad before the whistles went off, she'd pack everybody down to the storm cellar, knowing the whistles were going to go off. But my dad would have none of it. He said, Myrtle, I'm not, hit, I'm not going down in that hole again. I won't do it. And she said, Earl, we've got to go. This was a day when we'd had thunderstorm after thunderstorm after thunderstorm. And the radio from Oklahoma City, because we had those little transistor radios on all the time. With We had bags of batteries. <laughs> we had kerosene. We had water. We had slop jars. Sometimes we had 39, 40 people down there in that storm cellar my dad built. It was lined with bunk beds and benches. And uh, there were double sets of bunk beds and sets of benches and uh, some chairs and uh, a table down there to hold the lanterns, and et cetera. And on top, there at the top of the stairs, my dad had built uh, a door that opened and a covering and then a door at the bottom that you entered. And that night, my dad had his favorite TV shows coming on. Cheyenne was coming on. Sugarfoot was coming on. Maverick was coming on. And he wasn't going to go anywhere. And by golly, he talked Mom into going ahead and making dinner. And we served up dinner and cleared, the, cleared to the kitchen. And then the storm really started hitting hard, and the whistles went off. No time to wash the dishes. Mom grabbed us and went to the cellar, hollering back over her shoulder, Earl, get down here. Come on. Dad said, H-E double hockey sticks. No, I'm not <laughs> going, Myrtle. I'm not going to that hole. You take the kids. So he sat in there with the television on. Now, at that time, there was no such thing as cable. We had an antenna. Well, an antenna is a little more than a lightning rod, if you think about it. So there we were, down in the storm cellar. And all of a sudden, the door opened, and another family came in. And then another family came in. And we're listening to that radio, and the storm cell's moving closer, and it's a line of tornadoes. It's not just a tornado. It's a whole line of them. And the lightning is just so fierce. Um, and, um, and it caused a lot of fires. I mean, we had a lot of streak lightning that hit hard. And lots of stories about that. But nonetheless, back to this night. By the time it was 10 o'clock and time for the late news, we had 38 people in there. And nobody was going anywhere. The whistles kept sounding again and again. Dad still wasn't here. All of a sudden, we hear a loud boom. And we know something's been hit. It could have been a telephone pole. It could be power outages, the whole place. What we didn't know is that our house had been hit. Fortunately, it hit the antenna instead of the roof. But it went and boom, it blew the TV up. Thank God Dad was across the room because the glass flew by him and he got a cut on his cheek, but he didn't get blown with it. He yanked that cord out of the wall and he ran down 
and grabbed that upper door. And as he grabbed that upper door, he saw that lightning shoot through our house, right past him. And we had these great big old iron T poles with the lines for clothes lines for to hang your clothes. It hit that pole. It shot down those wires. It shot through that second pole and down into the ground next to that storm cellar. Dad's hair was all standing up and it smelled burnt. And my brother opened up that bottom door and he ran up and he jerked Daddy down into the storm cellar and ran up and closed that top door. And that wind howled and whistled and that tornado went on for another couple of hours before that. Maybe two or three in the morning, we emptied out. And Dad was burnt and frizzled and had a cut on his cheek. And you know what? The next time those whistles blew, my dad grabbed everybody and yelled, what the hell? And from that, on, that time on, that became the call for the storms. Hit the hole! And that's the night that Daddy blew up a TV. 